Hey, you asked for it. You got it. It's our quarterly Q&A, all question and answer show. Get in the corner office. We're going to get you some information. Time to roll Pensado's place. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, here with my wingman. Hadn't said that in a minute. Herb <laughs> Frawick. Uh, T-R-A-W-I-C-K-H-E-R-B. My good friend and confidant. Uh, today we're going to pick Herb's brain a little bit. Uh, I tell you, I'm blessed to be sitting to one of the most that's intelligent. Gonna, that's going to be a short show. <laughs> I'm blessed Not to be sitting. You, you're stepping on my joke, Herb. Oh, sorry. Dude. I'm sitting next to to my left is one of the most intelligent people I know. Drew Adams. Drew Adams. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. That's true. That's true. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. In fact, Drew Drew is actually thinks his camera's up there. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna figure it out but, one day. Uh, guys, in all seriousness, I'm uh, I'm blessed to have been friends with her for so long, and 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 uh, 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 God gave me my talent, but Herb gave me my opportunity, and uh, I want to share some of his expertise with you because. One of the themes I want to go over today a little bit is we're in a changing, morphing music industry. I can teach you how to make some great records. I can teach you how to engineer. I can teach you about the creative process. But if you don't understand the environment in which to use all this stuff in, it's going to be a little hard to get that next HD3 system set up because you're not going to be earning enough, enough money. So there is a balance between um, the information we're giving you and how to use it. And we told you early on in the early shows that we were going to try and give you a broad spectrum of how to uh, find different sources for your music via movies, via uh, this and that and the other, different sources for your talent like uh, post-production engineering, mixing for film, mixing for records. And the internet, of course, um, is, 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 is really uh, given us a lot of great opportunities, and then we've got the the DMP Dave's Magic Preamp. Uh, we've got a winner, Herb. We got a winner. We're going to tell them later on in the show. It's going to be cool. We're going to show them how they did it, what company did it, PromoJam.com. So stay tuned. It's going to be very cool. Yeah, we went th we went through great lengths to make sure this was fair. We'll go over that with you later. Um, Can we do a little bit of homework? Let's do it. So, um, our normal drill is make sure you reach out to us in all the various ways. You see the page popping up there. So, obviously, our Twitter handle, Facebook, um, YouTube channel. Um, and trust me, we are engaged with your comments. Um, all of us, I think, now speak back to you during the week as much as we can. So, uh, it's always informative. It's very helpful. Uh, so, make sure you reach out to us. Um, in our corner office, and by the way, the, the kind of expounding we're going to do on the business which Dave and I do often, it's important for you to do. That's going to be a part of the show, and then we're going to get to a really good and intensive corner office so we can get your questions and answered. Um, um, and last week, we had such a great week with Michael Brower, just what, what a superstar level guy, both mm -hmm. in his skill, um, but also the way he shared with us and the audience. He's doing something cool in France, correct? What's, what's he doing? Well, Michael, um, like several of our friends, Joe Barisi has a, a workshop that he does, uh, excellent, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Swedeen, I, I spoke with, with his, his people, and uh, Bruce has one that's really good. These are, these are incredible ways to get hands-on information, you know, and mm -hmm. Michael does one uh, with uh, some guys in France. Uh, you got a graphic ready, Will? There it is. Yeah, this is Michael's. It's uh, mixed with the Masters. Uh, the website and everything uh, is available to you. And I'm going to do this too. Um, no joke. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Michael invited me, and uh, the, the, I can't say the French gentleman's name, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do one. And Michael uh, has explained to me at length what he does with this, and I'm telling you, it's incredible. You get to sit with him for a week in the south of France. Uh, I, I think it's a bargain. I think it's really good. And or you can spend a week in Orlando with uh, or Ocala with with Bruce. Or you can you can spend uh, an afternoon with Joe over in Pacoima. Well, it's your choice. Well, there's another thing too. <laughs> Joe's gonna kill me. Why did there, I say that, Herb? There will be another opportunity to spend. Joe's time. got a beautiful studio. Yes, by he the way. does. Joe has a beautiful studio. But they're gonna have an opportunity to spend time with somebody else that I know. But we just can't talk about that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll announce that stuff later. You don't even know. 
stuff that stuff me and Will been working on. The Bunny Ranch in, yeah. in Nevada? Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yep. It's called, well, I can't say it, but the first word is Pensado, and the second, th and we'll get to it later. Okay. Um, but again, we've got our uh, giveaway coming up, which is really cool. Stay tuned for that. Uh, I see the chat room is full of stuff, so Drew is, Drew in the corner office is going to make sure we're firing things a day so we can get some questions answered. And, uh, should, should we put a little parameters on today's questions? Normally we just take shotgun. Should we, should we narrow the questions today to a... Yeah, I mean, I think you were talking earlier about having some philosophical stuff so you could expound on. A few shotgun things and stuff we're keeping around, but, but stuff that we've already asked or stuff that we've done in ITLs, that stuff is available for you to go back and look at. So we want to try to make sure that you're being challenging in your questions and so on yeah. and so forth. So Dave, I would you know. like to know, we've done, is this, is this episode 19? Yes. I would like to know which hair color and which hair length you've enjoyed most over the 19 episodes. Really important, because yeah. there's so, been seven or eight different so, color variations. So this is important to my wife and I, and um, if you can just let us know, then I'll try and standardize that. That yeah. was a request Drew made. There we go. Drew's very conscious of my, uh, my let's quaff. Get, let's Happy. get it going. All right. So guys, this is what I want to do. I can jump right in, right? Absolutely. Um, Newsflash, the, the, the music industry is in the toilet. Um, <laughs> music is not. Music is more popular than ever. More people now want to hear good music. They want to buy good music. But our industry is somehow having a little problem getting it to them. Now, let me, let me, let me preface that. I know most of the people in the industry, and, and to a person, the guys in the music industry, the executives, have an incredible passion for music. Most of them are underpaid, overworked, and they do this as a, as a labor of love. And I'm being serious. I'm not, I'm not kissing any ass here. Uh, I can name names. Uh, it's an industry that, that, that attracts very, very passionate people. But, <clears throat> but things have changed. The climate has changed, and, and, and some of these passionate people don't have total control over, <laughs> over the, their part of the industry. And, and a, a little computer company called Apple has come in and taken our uh, distribution model away from us. And so uh, we're going to pick Herb's brain because Herb keeps me solid. Sometimes, sometimes he just depresses the hell out of me with this news. And then recently I've been incredibly uh, uplifted by it. I was talking to my friend Damon Elliott today, and we were discussing this. As Ann and I discuss it, I, I think it would be valuable for you guys to understand that the passion, the, 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 the soil that all of this is grown in, I'm mixing about 10 metaphors, is still there. The, what, what made you get excited if you're, if you're 60, what made you get excited about the music that, that was from your childhood was that people just went out and made records. They didn't worry about selling it. There was nowhere to sell Zeppelin. Zeppelin wasn't on the radio and had a number one record. I'm exaggerating a little bit but for a point. But, but that's, that's, that's where we're at now. There's people out there making great records, and the, the traditional method of, of getting access to that music doesn't exist. So I want, I want Herb to expound on that, because he can do that so much better than I. Um, um, there's some groups out there like Adele, um, Mumford & Sons, uh, the entire Odd Future crowd, Novocaine by uh, Frank Ocean is one of my favorite songs. In fact, one of the cats you saw in here, one of my assistants, worked on that. Um, Andrew Yonkers by uh, Tyler, the creator. That's one of our favorites, isn't it, Drew? Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. Um, and uh, so, so there's stuff out there. And these guys, these guys, they didn't look for a, a, a way to sell their music first and then go create it. They created it and let the music sell itself. Now music's more about quality. It, 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 Herb, Herb, jump in here. It, it, like, like the old model was, you find a producer who writes a hit song, you put that song on your big ass artist, and then the song sells product. Now, it's about it's about singing, not necessarily singing, but it's about entertaining. It's bringing something. How, help me articulate this to the guys out here. Well, um, first let me say this. It, I have an opinion. There's lots of opinions out there. Um, what you just tried to describe from my perspective is exactly the problem and the solution. It used to be we could approach the model in one very connected chain of events and you could, and they were predictive. If you made a record, it was produced by such and such and it got this much promotion and it got this, it was 
the, the sales program at the store was X, and it would be positioned that way, and publicity did, and and you would get some results. It would translate to touring, and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of newsflash. We're in the middle of a, of a revolution, and by nature, revolutions are disruptive. Mm -hmm. So now all the pieces are separate. And, the, and, and you can't tie it together. You know, what you just described, I would maybe describe differently. Mm -hmm. In the old days, the artists might have written their own song. Mm -hmm. And they may have been on the independent. And they may have sold it out of their record. And then it got picked up because a radio station started playing in one city. And then that translated to, there were a number of different ways. So, so we're in this environment now where before... I, I'm listening. I'm going to take some notes because I'll forget these questions. Okay. So, so before... The company sort of controlled how it got to the consumer. The consumer waited for that information. Where do I buy it? What's the album cover going to look like? Where's the single going to be? The only place I could hear is at the radio station. I had to hear it a number of times. I, there was The mouse and technology gave the consumer the power. And the consumer has now diced that up into, I'm going to be selective about my money and my choices. If you waste my time, if you don't give me quality, I'm clicking and I'm gone. So now people are trying to figure out how do I fill all these different silos. So the live business is not necessarily connected to the record business. The promotion business is not necessarily connected to how much records are going to sell. Artist development and companies taking all this risk to build these artists and get to certain profiles sometimes get returned, sometimes they don't. In a little bit of a way, and I don't want to be too windy about it, it reminds me of our political system. So the real estate we all share is America. And we got all these parties fighting over a bunch of shit instead of being able to say, you have a point of view, I have a different point of view, but we better come together on something and figure out how to win it. Mm -hmm. The industry is going through changes. And by the way, to your point earlier, there's a lot of smart people in the business. There's wow. been billions of dollars spent on figuring it out. Yes, they were resistant in the beginning. Yes, music has taken on the chin. And the other side of it, too, is tech companies have taken advantage of the music. Some people think it's a wonderful thing. Some, there's, there's another point of view. Some tech companies have come in and just pimped the music business. And so, you know what, I'm going to grab the music from you. I don't really give a shit about the music, but I'm going to sell hardware. But I'm going to do it in a cool way, and you think it's cool. So you're going to keep buying my stuff because I'm making you think it's cool. But I'm getting rich as shit, and my stock price is going up. And I don't really care that much about the music. They're not necessarily building artists. They're not necessarily supporting the thing. Your copyrights aren't necessarily increasing in value, but their hardware is selling. And what's, what's, what, as, as engineers and as, and as a lot of producers and artists watch the show, mm -hmm. what, what is, do, do we have to sit idly by? How, how no. can we direct this? No, the beauty of what's happening is that when you flatten something, you create other opportunities in other places. So before, it used to be this channel where we'd all try to become you, essentially or you know, all the guys who've, been, who've graced us on the show. And at some point in time, you wanted to get to one of the major cities and get in a major studio and then start to be able to, to mix from big artists. We get emails and stuff from people all the time who have created their own mix business where they live. And the pricing models are different because by nature of flattening, prices get flattened. But people, I just got uh, one of the guys who interviewed you on a blog. He said, and he actually asked for advice. He said, look, I'm in, I think it was Philadelphia, he said, I'm making about four or $5,000 a month, but I'm doing $200, $300, $400 dollar mixes. But I'm thinking about coming to L.A. I don't know anybody here, but I just want to do that. And I said, weigh that very carefully, because yeah. you're absolutely building something. You're in proximity to New York. You have a chance to get good, because what I don't believe in is that you follow your craft off the cliff and then don't make a living, and then you end up as a garbage man. You, you, follow, you, you follow what he's saying? Does that, that makes sense to you, doesn't it, Drew? For the most part, yeah. What's the? Uh, my bad. I'm kind of back and forth at the chat room. But oh, okay. I got no, it. Do what you're doing. No, so, I, so, so, uh, so, Herb, radio no longer can dictate to us what we're going to buy, want, and listen to. Not MTV to is that. MTV is dead. Mm -hmm. So, let's say I'm a producer out there and I've got a song, or if I've got an idea, that idea needs to be predicated on. In the old days, it needed to be predicated on, on kind of like you, you had to pay attention to the latest things that were on the radio. Your sound had to sound a certain way. Your, you, and, and record companies looked for certain things that 
that mirrored closely what was already in existence. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's more about if you're a young kid out there, or even an old kid like us, uh, you need to create something that that, that, that that just that just undeniably provides entertainment value and gives people just three and a half minutes of escape from life, mm -hmm. and then and then trust the world to find it. Uh, you can you can get it to the world. And and not not by not by getting a real flashy name and throwing it up on my Facebook page, uh, you know John the greatest producer that ever lived, uh, Jones. Mm -hmm. That's not going to really help you. It's it's about the product, not the hype anymore. So a lot of you guys out there that are that are uh, that are thinking about becoming um, uh, Billy Hard Drive Williams, it's probably not going to work for you anymore. Right. The hype is gone. It's all about content. It's all about. Uh, 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 do you agree with me here? But Dell is kind of like a, a perfect example because nobody cared about Adele when, when we were talking about her earlier in the, in the early shows, mm -hmm. and then uh, rolling in the deep. I mentioned that way before anybody heard about it because it just had an honest emotional uh, connection for me. And, and she's an incredible singer, but she didn't build her her success on hits. The, the concept of building your success on hits is kind of gone, isn't it? It's about, it's about how do you describe what Adele does or what uh, Odd well, Future does or, well, or Mumford & Sons? Or, well, your definition has changed because all the things you're describing have hits. They don't have hits in the traditional record sets. They're hits with the public, not necessarily hits <coughs> on Billboard. But in some cases, because we should be fair, Columbia's done a great job with this Adele record because that Adele record is in a major system and they sort of learned that they didn't, they didn't need to interrupt the organic side of it and let that build and let that word of mouth build and all of a sudden it comes together. That's one model and that's the only point I'm making is that there's now several models and there's some models that, look, if you take the NBA which we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. The reason Miami, love them or hate them, we'll, we'll reserve that conversation later, is banking on those big three people is because they've spent a lot of money there's a lot of risk. They need to put bodies in seats and try to win because there's a thin line between those companies making money or not. So you can't necessarily tear down the institutions that still bet on the big horses. They have a different model. So the metaphor there is, is if you've got Stevie Nicks at your company, you, you, you're... Or Beyonce or somebody, you, you may approach that differently. Uh -huh. The beauty of Mumford & Sons and other folks is that that comes up organically um, they charge differently for their shows. They do different things. The, t you, you ask several questions. Let me answer one big one for our audience, which is the default position is innovate. You well, want to innovate. innovate. I like that. So whether you're mixing or you're making music or you're thinking about distribution or you're doing whatever, try to think outside the box. The marketplace rewards you thinking out of the box eventually. It's tough. It's slower, and the biggest problem people have in making the transition from the old model to the new model is the newer model is much slower. The results will last longer if you get there, Good point. Good but point. it's much slower. So if you're not innovating, you're replicating. Now, there's... Oops. I think he went. Uh, I think. Am I getting went, all Jesse uh, Jackson? Uh, I'm getting Jesse good. Jackson on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but to that point, some people make a great living. I, I think you went Johnny Cochran, man. I think that was a whole that's level that's, above that's Jesse. Even, that's even a deeper level. <laughs> but but nonetheless, now now I'm off into Johnny racial Cochran. metaphors. Um, nonetheless, there are some people who use replication to manage the model. So I, I'm not going to be the guy that sits here and knocks you for using Dr. Luke or some of our other friends who still do really incredible work inside a certain model. And, and that has a, that has a, that has a yeah. And so the, so the challenge is... That was for, a good sentence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's where you're more articulate with things Damn. today. So, so the opportunity... I, again, I call them medical excuses. So, so what you have now is that opportunity often looks like challenge, or challenge often is opportunity. And so when guys are on the, not in the major system, they're trying to figure out what do I do to try to get myself to the next stage. First, you innovate. Secondly, get up to bat. Get up to bat as much as you can. Whatever up to bat is in your world, you will not be fine sitting back and waiting for somebody to find you, a hit to happen. You can't. Look, our show is an example of that. I mean, we won't bore them with all the details. But we had a different idea a year ago. We 
on a on a chance we came down to see a friend, mm -hmm. had a discussion, mm -hmm. turned into this because we just kept swinging at things. So it's a little weird because it's like the wild wild west. Yeah, the I old rules it. don't I, apply. I love the opportunity. Drew, like on 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 the odd future guys. I mean, how, how many times a day are they posting on Tumblr? I mean, that's that's how that's what separates them. They're they're almost like the new popular model. Like they're. It's not like it's being forced out. They literally just said, we're going to do our own shit and put it out and constantly do it. And it started snowballing. And it's like that seems to be the model because the, the playing field is like leveled now. That's what via, you know, via the Internet. You know, that's I well, the, the, and I think what our audience should be aware of is, and this happened in the old model and the new model to me. It's just to give my opinion. There are a lot of people putting their shit out. Mm -hmm. There's only a few that rise to the top. The internet is so wide and it flattens so much. Look, it, again, just my opinion. I think MySpace got flattened because so much music. Yeah. Interface was bad. It was all about music. There was a lot of music that wasn't good. So, so yes, you can put your music out. Tyler and those guys are good yeah, and they're doing something good. interesting. And they are committed and passionate at working at it. So Passion my, and committed. So man. my point is, is that this is a lot of work. So while it's flattened, people think I should come out and, and results will come back. No, you got to put a game plan together. You got to go to work. You got to be consistent about it. You have to change your expectations in terms of results. And then when you start to break through, which we're experiencing, then there's things that you have to do strategically to break through. So, so before you used to have a company that would do that for you. You could be the artist. Now you're the company. So when you marry your girlfriend, you need to meet her parents. When you work for a company that that owns by that's owned by another company you need to know about that company if you don't learn a little bit about the business that you're in you're just going to be sitting around with your plugins and your and your laptop and stuff thinking that you're getting better and not having any measurable result to measure that round of applause for Herb Trot. Thank, thank you thank you thank you thank Herb, you uh, <laughs> I'd say I'd say we, we, we you know obviously we, we can't cover everything and, and, and but I really appreciate the depth of your explanation and and you have to rewind this several times and, 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 and check what Herb said and then... Or just forget everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then maybe in the future, you know, maybe episode 50 or something like that, maybe we can have a little panel Be great. And, and discuss some of this further. But in the meantime, guys, I want you to think about what Herb is saying because it's our, it's our future, I promise you. I, 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 I'm kind of known as having a little bit of vision about the industry and, and it's as clear as the... Uh, knows on my face that, that, that this change is real, it's happening, it's coming, it's here. And, 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 and we can, we can it, it's a good thing. Don't, don't be scared. It's not, it's not that you're never going to get to make records for uh, the Rolling Stones anymore, but what it is is that you're going to get to make records the way you want to make them for the people that, that want your records. That and, may become the Rolling Stones faster than the Rolling Stones became the Rolling Stones. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll touch on this again because I think it's very important. But um, um, and then and then I wanted to get into Spotify. I wanted to get into a lot of uh, Zynga, like uh, Gaga is all over Zynga now. And um, but but we'll save that for a future because I really want to get to your questions. Uh, I'm gonna start the questions off by with, reminding them oh. that we're gonna give away this thing at the at the end of the show. I know who won it. I know <laughs> we, who won we do it. know you who don't. won. We do know who won. So stay tuned for our giveaway. It's a cool thing. Um, I, I, I wish I'd written it down. I, I trusted my memory, and once again, it failed me. Uh, someone asked me, what have I taken away uh, and learned from all these shows? And so I asked Will to, to make me a list of the shows, and I, uh, and I wanted to be fair to everyone on the show because I've learned a little something from every one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over uh, this. It's only going to take 10 seconds, so don't anybody panic. But on the first show, we had Ariel Shobas talking about how he made the Nicki Minaj album, and... and um, I was impressed at, at how he used the MacDSP plugins and got so much color and, 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 and emotion out of those plugins. But also, too, it made me jealous because Ariel got to record, track, engineer, yeah, that mix. Was the cool part about it. Yeah, and, and so he had a lot of control. Sometimes her control ain't a good thing, but in Ariel's case, he used it to his advantage. And then my, my good, dear buddy, Jean Marie Horvath, by the way, I spoke with Jean Marie, and we're going to have a special into the lair with Jean Marie really, really soon, uh, explaining some things to you about uh, uh, the way he works in logic. But 
I'm still shocked how what John Marie can get out of a pair of R tones. And then of course, uh, every, I'm gonna say this about every one: their passion. The, the you, these people, ugh, John Marie is so passionate. Then my, my 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 dear fishing buddy, if you're on the if you're on the chat room now, Dylan Dylan and I are talking back and forth about the big barracuda bite that's going out in Santa Monica Bay. Dylan Dresdo, um, Dylan. Uh, we were talking about our model, you know, about the, the Dylan is the perfect person for the for the future because Dylan is his own man. Dylan, uh, I've seen Dylan turn down major projects to do an indie because his heart was there and he felt something passionate about about that. Dylan does Dylan. He doesn't do Dylan Part B or Dylan trying to be like me or mm -hmm. anybody else. Dylan is his own person. I, I, I love the uniqueness of what he does, but. Um, just the sound of his records, I can see his personality. Dylan, Dylan mixes like he dresses, which I think is a good, I think that's a compliment. I don't think that's an insult. He's, he's just a great guy. And then Tony Maserati, uh, just the, the, the intensity and the, the belief in, in, in music that he gets to come through his mixes and, and his approach to, to getting that. And, and, Another and snappy consistently, dresser. Yeah, consistently. Well, actually, Dylan won't admit it, but when we were working a long time ago on some early Destiny's Child stuff, Tony was coming up to the studio with a tie. Mm. Every night we'd have cigars and scotch. Mm. That's when Dylan started wearing the tie. Well, he go. won't admit that, there but I go. know that's true. Um, and then um, Manny American, my good friend, uh, the thing I took away from Manny is Manny's another one of those guys that's so unique. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he, just brings, he just brings a freshness and a... Like, like all of these engineers that we're talking to, they've got a vision. They've got a vision for their sound. Now, they won't, they won't tell me that my sound sucks and their sound is great. They respect other people's sounds, but they know exactly the sound they want, and none better than Manny. Manny knows exactly what he tries to get out of a record, and, and we all can get the same things out of those records, but different ways, and I love the way Manny does it. But the main thing I took away from Manny, because I've known Manny for 20 years, um, is when he said, remember Herbie said, I start with the, with the highest energy part of the track and then work backwards. I, I started doing that and it really mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. um, that was Keisha. Keisha did a lot of that. You, you pick your, like, your favorite part and then just build off of that. Yeah. It really good. Like the vocals and everything. I agree. And then, and then my, my dear friend uh, Jason Joshua, um, I said on that show that I learned so much from Jason as, as my assistant. And, and, uh, 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 it was great to see him organize his thoughts in such a way and present them to you, but uh, Jason is probably as passionate as anybody I've ever met about about sound, and Jason's a very emotional person. He, he, he Sometimes he fools people because he's ex-football player and a badass extraordinaire, but Jason knows how to, how to get you to respond to music and uh, uh, I, I particularly like the way he talked about the, the low end on the mixes and, and, and how he worked with 808s and stuff. Um, and then our dear friend Maureen Droney. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with the passion with which uh, she's taken that organization and tried to do some really good things with that organization. Mm -hmm. She's the best. A lot of good people in there. I really like uh, um, can't, can't even read this here. Oh, yeah. The, set, the, the, the show we have with the assistants with Drew and Chris. Classic. And uh, Classic. Jesus. Uh, I hope you understood how hard these guys work. I mean, you have no idea. Just look at Drew. You can tell the man ain't slept in three days. A little beat up. A little beat I up. know he hadn't slept because I didn't either. And then uh, E-Man, Emmanuel. Uh, uh, Drew and I were talking before the show, and I, I was impressed that, that E-Man... Uh, he, 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 he's, he's a true, he's an artist, he's a singer, he's a, he's a great musician, and, and that mentality he brings into the productions that he does, and, and he, 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 he used, I was surprised that he used a lot of soft sense and stuff yeah. like that, but not surprised that they sound so great, because that, that like Bruce Wadeen said in his show, if you want to get good references, go to live shows. Now, Bruce wasn't saying listen to the sound of a guitar at a live show and mimic that, uh, I'm speaking for Bruce, so Bruce, if I'm wrong, tell me. But I, what I took away from Bruce is Bruce was saying, go to live shows and understand the emotion, and then when you get back in this cold, dark 
studio bring that emotion out of the speakers so that, so your live references aren't necessarily for sound but for the emotion like like you know our first musical experiences were probably concerts that we remember it was for me and then of course Dan and Dave Huff uh, I, I, I was I was shocked at, 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 at the understated uh, simplicity with which uh, Dan described how, what he does. I it's, mean, a, it's kind of refreshing when like I mean because everybody can act like they know everything about yeah. engineering but it's refreshing when you get somebody that is successful and just uses the equipment as a tool not as a show off look what I can do yeah. and explain it's just like uh, I use the blue thing yeah. it's like you're right that's how it's supposed to be used yeah. it's just a tool. But man those guys are those guys you gotta listen to Giant that was their band in the in the 90s incredible musicianship and then our our, 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 our buddy Ed Cherney and Rose um, uh, Ed, when, I, when Ed first said, you, you've got to get the business right, I was like, well, I'm a hippie. We don't care about business. <laughs> and, and, and then it, when he expounded on that, I understood what he meant. That's a great show. And then, and then no one has more passion here again than Ed Cherney. I mean, he, when he goes to make a record, he's, he's, he's trying to change the world. He ain't, he ain't playing around. He's make, he makes great records. And then... And then our, our our favorite prop 215 guy, <laughs> Mike, Mike Dean. Dean. Uh, you guys you guys were a little hard on Mike, but uh, Mike can take it. He's a big boy. But I was really impressed with the simplicity with which Mike worked. He now simplicity in terms of selection of equipment, not in terms of Mike is very deep. He's like Ariel. Mike r records the records, writes the records, produces the records engineers the records, mixes the records, and masters all those records. And plays live. <laughs> and plays live. He's right. the MD for the band. They're, I just talked to Mike yesterday. He's in Morocco having a wonderful time. But wh I, I, I keep wanting some of these guys to give me the magic formula, like, well, I use this exotic piece of gear, and then I can run out and buy that piece of gear. Mm -hmm. But no. I mean, Mike uses the stuff that we all have. He just makes it sound a hell of a lot better than us because he's not... He's not worshiping the tools he's he, he's he's using those tools to construct you know i mean kanye's records are, are are beyond question they're really good records and then um we learned a lot about poultry from bruce wadeen <laughs> bruce was uh, that was that was just one of the highlights of, of my career so far talking with him talk about passion the man grabs his laptop and goes walking around showing us his piano miking technique i mean he's as passionate I, I was just so refreshing, and then, yeah. and I learned about the Bloom Line pair. I learned, um, I learned so much, so much from Bruce. Uh, uh, and then um, Phil Tan. Um, what I took away from Phil was was a humility and a humbleness that that, that, I, that I, I could stand to learn a little more of. But also too, Phil Phil articulated the concept of of, of really paying attention to what what you're given. And, and sometimes, if, if we were barbers, sometimes people just want, to, want a little trim off the back, cut the sideburns a little bit. They don't want a whole new hairdo. And Phil made me, made me realize that sometimes I have to, 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 to check and see what, what people want. Sometimes in the past, I, I go a little crazy and just do too much. And, and Phil, uh, like, like, uh, like Ariel and Mike Dean, he, he gets so much out of, out of the same gear we all have. It, it just kind of pisses me off sometimes because his records sound so good. And then Joe Barisi, there again, um, I, 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 I know quite a bit about music. I know music theory. I, I, I've got a really good, solid foundation in music. And somehow I tend to not have a great respect for people like that. I, I've always liked the music made by people that know a lot less because sometimes when you know too much, it restricts you. Yeah. Uh, Joe is one of the one of the geniuses in music, and he uses that knowledge probably better than anyone. His, his records, some of the uh, Queens of the Stone Age records, the Melvins, some of those records. If 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 I could mix like that, I'd quit tomorrow. I mean, those those mixes are are spectacular. And then, round of applause, Michael Brower. Hey, classic. I thought Michael had a six foot goat in his room. It turned out to be a little four inch toy goat. But that, that little goat um, symbolizes Michael Brower, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. He, uh, that little goat to me showed his passion, his, 
his sense of humor, and when I listen to Michael's work, I, I feel his personality. And, and Michael, when he started showing us uh, all, all his, all his uh, pulling out those drawers with all the delays and stuff, oh man, that was you just, God, it's just so heartwarming to see uh, that, that he still has that passion. But Michael is all about the music. He has all that equipment, and, and yet he, he, he makes some of the most passionate, like, his John Muir work is, is, is incredible. I mean, everything Michael does has that personality. Uh, the serious side, the humorous side, the emotional side, the intellectual side. And then uh, up to today's show, um, the Herb Trowick show. Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's the Q&A with D, D. Pensado and... Dave's Magic Preamp. Absolutely. Absolutely. DMP. Absolutely. Giving it away shortly. Stay tuned. <coughs> Let, let's get in the corner office and get some uh, yeah, questions, questions answered. Questions. Drew, you want to fire away? Yeah, what I, what I told people today was hit me with philosophical questions, stuff that, you know, because you get, we always talk about vocal chains and everything like that. Here it is. First one, how do you know you're done? <laughs> how do you know you're done with mixing? Well... The way you know you're done is there's about 10 people outside with uh, messengers saying, we've got to get this crap to mastering now. If we don't make it to mastering now, you won't make yeah, the record. Right. right. I, 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 I don't think we're ever done. I think we just run out of time. Um, yeah. What about like up-and-comers that don't have like a deadline, per se? You know? Well, you need, you, you need deadlines. You deadlines. Deadline. Um, I read a quote by, um, uh, what's the guy that does Saturday Night Live? Uh, Michael's... Um, Lauren Michaels. Lauren Michaels said, mm -hmm. said uh, I don't try, uh, he said, I, I can't make the best show I can. I make the best show I can by 11.30 Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes that's the hardest thing for me. Uh, all my assistants will tell you uh, I'll find ways to, to, to get an extra hour, extra 30 minutes. But sometimes we're the only ones that hears that. So I, I'd say I can't answer that question. I, I, no, I think you do. I really think you do. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. Well, I mean, like, you just, you need a deadline. You've seen me do it. I, yeah. I got hits on the radio, and I'll still go back in the studio and, and redo the mix again, just because I, I, for me, I'm yeah. the only one that hears it, because I, I, I hear it on the radio, and it drives me nuts. It's something I think I can do better. Here's another good one. Uh, what are some ways to keep your endurance up in the studio? After all oh, that's, you know what, that's really good. The opposite of what you think. Uh, no caffeine, no fat, no, no fried stuff. Drink a lot of water, and, I'm, and uh, uh, this is worth listening to. Pay attention to this. When you were a kid and your dad woke you up at at, at six and uh, at three in the morning and said, "Son, we're going fishing. Son, we're going to the fair." You wake up and you feel great all day. <coughs> but your dad comes in, and wakes you up, and says, "Son, we're going to go get that root canal now and hang out with that aunt you don't like," and you're just dragging all day. So it's, it, a lot of it has to do with mental expectations too. Uh, if, you, if you're excited about staying up, like Drew and I just recently stayed up all night, a couple of nights in a row on a, on a Keisha Cole mix, and, and we just had fun. I mean, we were, we were just, we were giddy like little kids. It was just so much fun. Except that third day. <laughs> the third day was a little tough. Uh, but um, I would say lots of water, lots of fluids, no caffeine. Caffeine makes you do this. You just get on this roller coaster ride you can't get off of. And fat, and uh, no fat, no no fries, and yeah, mental sure. attitude. All right. Do you like having the artist in the studio when you mix? That's kind of the point, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be a smart ass. I'm just genetically dis disposed to be one. Um, but yes, I do. Um, I can take more risks when, when I've got the producer and the artist there. Otherwise, I have to be a little more conservative. But if I can do something crazy and look over at him and say, do you like this, and get an instant feedback, then, um, then I can make better records. Yeah, because most of the time, I mean, it seems like the common thread is that people don't like the artist in the in Well, the try room. to give somebody a haircut when they don't show up. Yeah. <laughs> well put, well put. OK, um, how do you keep inspired working with material that doesn't initially excite you? from uh, Dark Pine Studio. Well, that's where I'm blessed with a good ego. What happens with all of us is that once we start, even if we don't like everything about it, we tend to like what we've done. And as what we've done increases, you like it more and more. Well, isn't that an odd thing, you know? Uh, I, I, I used to, I can find things. Uh, my mom said one time, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And so 
uh, she introduced me to this pretty heavyweight girl, and I said, well, she doesn't sweat much for a fat girl. So <laughs> I, I said something nice. You just sometimes you just got to find you just got to find the the, the the part of the mix where they don't sweat much. <laughs> All right, sorry. Am I going to get sued for that, Herb? I am, lawyers are on my BlackBerry right now. <laughs> oh gosh, why do I do this to myself? All right, here's one from Pay-Per-View Studios. You know, Pay-Per-View Studios! <laughs> Question for Herb. Ooh. How much money does a point translate to it? Uh, I'm sorry, a point translate uh, on a typical major label record? The, that's one of the problems with points is that there's such a wide... So there's such a wide swath. It, it depends on your deal, depends on your royalty rate, depends on what you've, the records are being sold for. Good question, Dylan. It, it, it really is a good question. And um, I've worked with artists who have sold platinum records and not received royalties because of the amount of money that was spent in getting them to platinum. So it's this sort of, it's not a typical range. It, it just doesn't exact out into something where you can go, it means... X. Can you can you do a little research and, and, and bring that information to us in a week or two? Because there's there's difference yeah. like there's producer points, there's mm -hmm. artist points, mm -hmm. and, and there's different types of points. It's not a simple answer. It's well, there's d the the point itself may be a specific, but the definition of that of how that point's applied will change its monetary value back to you. That that's the. What I'd like to know is, is, is Dylan's question, but then like if you have half the writing or all the writing on a record that sells a million copies, what is your, what is your publishing on that? There's mechanicals, there's, there's performance. Mm -hmm. We should break that down for people maybe yeah, in a couple different of things. weeks. I mean, performance stuff comes from performance societies, certain things come from sales. Yeah. yeah, and that has a lot to do with where it's performed. If it's performed in the yoga class in the gym and the ASCAP has given them a license, then depending on that relationship, which is a ASCAP is controlled by the writers, that money comes back to you differently because in a collective pool than what happens when it sells. And so that kind of arcane stuff, which is not really arcane, it's the way the business is, has been part of the resistance to that part of that is changing because of the change that's going on in the business. Also, now. too, um, um, the reason you can't put an exact number on some of this stuff is because our business was started by a couple, not a couple, but a few unsavory characters who found it was to their advantage to keep people in the dark about all of this. It used to be that way. Uh, that's, that's changed by and large. It's, it's very hard to stay in the dark now with lawyers and other kinds of things. It's just that people have bought into a system that when it changed and the labels are trying to reflexively change and come up with things like 360 deals and so on and so forth. But again, it's the definition. A point on a single is different than a point on an album. A point on something else is different than... Okay. So th there's just... There's Would different you mind specific that? No, it's fine. Okay, great. We got a, um, like an add-on to that from, actually, from Will, producer. Uh, Follow-up to Dylan's question. How effective are publishing companies in paying out royalties in the internet age. Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's another interesting question. Um, the traditional publishing companies um, oftentimes acted like kind of a box and they just got requests in and they would answer that request and they would pay for this catalog and it would just sit there and while their maintenance and administration and so on and so forth was not bad um, there are other newer publishing company iterations that are that exist now, like Primary Wave and other kinds of things, and they're trying to take a much more aggressive marketing approach in non-traditional ways. And, and I'll give you an example, because um, we have the other my other job. We have a deal with this company called Primary Wave, and I'm not touting them over others. I'm just saying there's new ways to approach it. I think they signed Steven Tyler, <clears throat> and one of the deals they did was with the Massachusetts Lottery for some of their music and Steven Tyler and the band got a small percentage of the lottery income for lottery tickets. That's they a non-traditional approach and a new way. So because the business has changed, it used to be you just tried to get things covered in movies and films and commercials and records and all that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, that's a tougher thing for, for publishing companies now. It's harder to get songs covered. It's harder because everything's become so niche and kind of clickish and in-house. So Say niche again. Niche. Niche, niche. Niche. Yeah, it's like niche. negotiation, negotiation. I don't know. I gotta go with him. He's the, <coughs> he's the intellect here. Cunning linguist. So they're they're trying to handle the internet age and then trying to to your to your point, Will, um, because it's new and because the modeling in terms of the economics are not the same, these companies are trying to figure out how do they still resource reaching into the space, but not necessarily knowing what the return is coming back on. 
Um, last piece, what, one of the things that we have found, because the company I work with has a pretty established, amazing catalog over 40 years, is Earthling and Fire catalog, and I, I, my partner, one of my partners is the founder of the group. Um, and interestingly enough, we talk to publishing companies, now companies don't want to pay for the original music. They would rather go hire somebody to make a version of the song, not have to pay record companies for the master use, They'll work out a publishing deal, and if the publishing deal is too expensive or whatever, they'll go find something else. So no longer is this notion of having to get that original song the driving force for commercials and so on and so forth because they think they're overvalued. What switched is, is they now believe, no, 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 you don't have the audience artist. I have the audience. My product goes to millions and millions and millions of people, and you're lucky if you go to a million people. Wow. So when my Coca-Cola goes out, I'm going to 20 or 30 million people. You're lucky if you're double platinum. Why am I overpaying you? Let's figure out how we've changed this relationship. So that's an example of where this Holy is flattening. And you, you can't, can't blame them. It's hard, it's hard argument to argue with. Uh, all right, let's delve away from the industry business questions. We're going to get back to philosophy. And Dave, mm -hmm. um, question from Soundright Pro. How do you not doubt yourself while mixing? What makes the tool you choose? <laughs> no laugh yet. Hold on. You should answer that. Uh, oh, man. All my guys will tell you I doubt myself every second of the day. Uh, the reason my, my assistants and I become so close is because I, 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 um, I, 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 I doubt myself. I'm doubting myself at this moment. I think my depends are working, but I'm just not sure. Um, Everybody's laughing out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be serious with you, I think I think I think I still get nervous before every mix. I, st I still approach a mix in in in, a, in sheer panic and terror if I'm going to be able to do it. It's a lot of pressure, man. Having somebody's livelihood, their career, the future of their children, everything depending on what you do. I take it. I, I take that that responsibility serious, and then I and then at some point you just have to trust your your instincts and. And, and, and when, you, when, when you hit play and you like it, you're done, and you're done. Um, but um, I second guess, and I get, I, I, you know, all those, all those little cliches, trust your first instincts mm -hmm. and all that, you know. I got a tattoo of that right here somewhere. I never look at it, though. It's tough, man. I'm telling you, it's tough. Uh, and everyone's different. I know some guys. Um, uh, there's a mixer named Alan Meyerson who does a, a, a lot of uh, movies, and I've seen Alan... EQ a track, set the fader, and never touch it again. It's done. I mean, he's like, he knows exactly what he wants. I, I think we're all different. And uh, for me, uh, I like I like dynamic changing mixes every, you know, uh, Alan is a little more direct. I, I hope I'm being, we'll have Alan on the show and ask him because he's, he's one of the people that I admired and still do. When I first started, he was, he was like someone I, I, I copied a lot. If I could just add to that, um, doubting yourself, if you're not failing, you're not trying. So you have, like, doubts are just doubts. It's just, you got to get past that because the only person that's going to do it for you is you. So if I could yeah, preach, It's not like being at the free bit. throw line with no time left and you're down by one. That's, doubting yourself yeah. there is a little different. Doubting yourself in the creative process is a little different. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good point, though, Drew. Yeah. Uh, let's get... A uh, question for Herb. Will the Weirdo question, do they believe the 360 deals are good or bad for the industry? Who is they? You. Oh, do, do we believe? That's a good question. Or no, it, it says, do they believe? Right. Well, I guess, Herb, I guess yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you guys. The, the truth of 360 deals is that they are um, sort of universally reviled, but specifically when you're in the midst of one, it's really you and your representatives negotiating with the company how much you will give them of stuff. So you may say, yes, you can participate in my merchandising, but we're only going to give you half of the revenue off of one shirt. We're only going to give you, so you have some control about what you specify. The industry position is that we promote all this stuff, we make it possible for you to have all these kinds of things, we're losing revenue, should we take the position to participate in that or not? It's a, it's, most people disagree. Um, I personally don't think that they have saved the business. So as a model, forget about my personal and emotional stuff. From an analytical standpoint, 
I don't know. It obviously hasn't turned around the revenue side. It hasn't changed it. Seems to have pissed a lot of people off. But in reality, most companies have, and these are parent companies that make these decisions because there are a lot of financial people, they have a hard and fast rule that they won't sign things that are in a 360 deal because of the money that they lose. So I, I personally think that they're not that effective. And in some cases, they create really bad tensions between you and a label. Um, if you can avoid it, try to. If you can't avoid it, then you negotiate the stuff <coughs> down to something that you can live with. And I've seen a lot of times where the artist is giving very little back to the record company in return for them not only giving them more money, but also having to be involved in building that brand out for them so you can actually, you can put, you can institute some controls in 360s. Good to know, good to know. Uh, back to you, Dave. Um, can Dave elaborate on his version of the rule of thirds, now that we've had time to look I up? Thought, I thought the question was, can Dave elaborate on being a virgin? <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Hey, I'm Espanol. We, know, we don't got no virgin. <laughs> I sound Italian when I'm Spanish. I didn't, I didn't, want, I didn't know what language it was, because you're usually a little okay, bit ebonical. So, so far, we've, we've got the uh, weight challenge people suing me. We've got yeah. several ethnic groups, Johnny Cochran, so. Females. <laughs> He was. Great the internet. Um, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, can you elaborate on the rule of thirds? Yeah, I knew what the question was. I just need some time. Gotcha. You know what? Uh, that's a pretty complex thing. Uh, that's going to take. Um, can can you can you remind me? Do we have, yeah. do we have to do a show on that because it's much broader than that. Basically, the concept. <laughs> basically, the concept is is the application of, of use of your senses in one area and applying those senses to a, another area and understanding how your, your sense of hearing is related to your sense of sight. And so... The paintings and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So it's not just the rule of thirds. It's a, it's a, that's just a small part of it because your sense of taste is very similar to your, 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 your sense of hearing. Like, 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 like the spices in, in different foods can be... Uh, analogous to certain things in the other world. So this isn't a quick question. I'm not blowing you off, but uh, uh, I, 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 I've been working on that. I've been trying to prepare some graphics and things to be able to squeeze it into a couple of 30-minute shows, but I've done two-hour lectures on that, and I've got two different people that have done master's thesis papers based on, on, on some of my work. Uh, so it, it's pretty complex, but it's, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Got a homework to do? Um, it's coming up. I mean, the cool part is that we're getting close to announcing our giveaway of that beautiful Michael Loman BAE DMP 1073. Um, it's kind of exciting. We used a very cool company. By the way, this was used by me and Estero. This thing is incredible. Um, and I remember Estero, I actually talked to her, and she's, she was just so pleased. And she's a real purist. You know, oh, no. she, she knows deal. her stuff. This is no joke. She, yeah. I was talking to Stero last night. I think she's a perfect artist for the future, don't you? Yeah, she's, kind she's of. got that integrity. Mm -hmm. She's a talent, and she's so intelligent. Talented. Yeah, she's, she's, she's she, really bright about it. Yeah, and uh, she's so gifted. So the cool part is our giveaway is coming up, and um, um, you know what? We used a really cool company to to manage the process so that we can make sure it was a random draw. It's called ProJam.com, uh, PromoJam.com. Sorry, and the, and they use Twitter. They're, you can see their see their website up on the screen now. They used, you know, three platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and MySpace to make sure we got <coughs> all the requests in, and they actually randomly pick uh, this winner whose name is right here on this little slip of paper we have right here. So we'll be telling you about, about that in a minute. Um, a couple more. Let's, let's ask yeah, yeah, another yeah. question or two, and then we'll do the giveaway. Okay, sure. Um, somebody asked, uh, it was Tito Beats. He wants to, he's curious. Oh, Tito, on, I see his name all the time. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's curious on how you set, how you set a vibe in the studio. Um, we should answer that. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this. Flatulence is not involved. Um, <laughs> usually. <laughs> oh, Depends, my God. No promise. Flatulence. Yeah, you're all today. Is there a group? Is there a flatulence group? There is. A flatulence there is. group there I'm worrying about now. calling right now. You know what? I think, uh, I think that's an incredibly uh, good question and, and, and very complex because uh, it, it points to the fact that you understand the importance of vibe in the room. Uh, we have fun at my sessions, and I think that, that, that 
We're making records to try to entertain people, and if we can't entertain ourselves in the process, you're not going to make some... I just don't like the records that come out of one guy alone in a cave. Uh, that's a harsh statement. Of course I do, but um, we have fun. I mean, I tease my assistants. They tease me. We play tricks on them. They'll, uh, you know, we, we, uh, I, I like lava lamps. I'm not quite sure why. I think Dave Wrights has got me started on lava lamps, but I, I love lava lamps and... and uh, about like like creating like getting the artist like a fresh new artist never talked to you before. Oh, well, Drew seen me do this. I, the first if, if it's a young artist, I sit down and I tell him, look, I might I might have all this success, but but I work for you. You're my boss. If you're if you're if, you know if you're 14 years old, I work for you. Be comfortable. Uh, treat me like the bitch that I am. Just tell me what you want. <laughs> uh, I'm here to get what you want. I can do, I'm capable of doing anything in the studio. But sometimes I don't know exactly what to do, and I try to I try to lay a foundation where people fully understand that that my job is twofold: to give them what they want and to not let them make mistakes. There's times when I have to pull rank and say, "Look, this isn't going to work on radio. This isn't going to work on iTunes." Uh, but most of the time, it's like, "Well, if that's your idea, let me figure out how to make it great." And more often than not. Uh, uh, the ideas just kind of escalate. I was doing a song a long time ago. I, I wish I could think of a more recent example, but um, I had a suggestion, and my suggestion was really bad, but when the person sang the suggestion back, it sounded really good the way he sang it, and it ended up being a big hit record. By the way, we we got to make a note to find out what song Dave Huff put that 808 on in the country world. I don't... I did, no, he didn't, he didn't say... I don't think he said he yet. He didn't say, no. I think he's holding out on us. All right, so we got... The end all be all to the questions. Miami or Chicago? Ooh. I'm from Miami, but I, my heart's with Chicago. I don't know why. Um, we, got a, we got a woohoo out there. That was Mo. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, I, uh, LeBron arguably has, has won me over in terms of his skills and abilities. I, I used to question, but uh, I would be happy if either team won. I would have been happier if the Lakers won, but. Uh, Herb and I uh, are basketball aficionados. Uh, well, Herb's, Herb's just a downright fanatic. That's, Herb defines the word fan. Um, he wears the same underwear if it was lucky for one game. That's a little too much info, isn't it? Herb? Yeah, I was trying to figure out purple and gold drawers. Yeah. Just not. But uh, cool. Herb and I, we like we like the basketball players as much as we like teams. So uh, I'm more pull for for individuals as opposed to teams a lot of times, but Chicago's got a wonderful story. It's easy to, 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 to obviously the Heat are the front runners. It's easy to kind of sometimes not like the front runners and, and, and like the underdogs. I went to college in the ACC, so uh, obviously I was, I was a big Michael Jordan fan, and then when Michael was at the Bulls, I was a big Bulls fan because of Michael and my ACC background, and then when uh, Phil came to the Lakers, remember I, I, I didn't like the Lakers, but when Phil came to the Lakers, I started liking the Lakers, and um, I, I left Miami by the time the team got down there, so I don't really feel that much for them. But I guess if I had to pick, I, I, I like the story of the Bulls. I like the way the way they play. They play like a team. They 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 do things a lot of things right. The Heat are incredibly impressive. It's, there's nothing like watching those guys on a, like LeBron and Dwayne on a fast break. Gee whiz, it's a piece of art. What, what you, said, you said the Bulls? Um, I like the Bulls, but I, it's not because I dislike Miami for, for the reasons that a lot of people just, you know, a lot of people get sort of hyped up on the way LeBron did the decision and the way they entered. They, they put together an incredible team. Pat Riley still and always will be a Laker, so I applauded the way he runs the organization. Mickey Aronson's a great owner. Um, I just think that Tom Thibodeau, with the defensive um, sort of mindset he brings to the game, is good for the NBA overall. Chicago had the best record for a reason. They're aggressive for a reason. Derrick Rose is MVP for a reason. And they, a bunch of young guys have got to take on some guys in Miami who have been. Dwayne Wade has won before. LeBron has not. But they've got more experience, so it's interesting. Kind of, it's, while they're the front runner, Chicago, in terms of season, they kind of have to knock off the giant, and it just makes for kind of. Did a, this turn into uh, ESPN yeah, or something? A little bit. We can go there too. So <laughs> let's do a giveaway. <laughs> giveaway time. Mike drum Pre, roll. here we go. Here we go. Drum roll. So the winner is. Do you want to announce it? 
Yes, I do. <laughs> there you go. Drew Remember. Adams. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Brian, B R Y A N. Boyhan, B O Y. Brian Boyhan, let's give him a hand. All right, Brian, you won. Let me reiterate, this was this was done via computer, no human hands. I'm serious, 100% serious. Promojam.com. We demanded, we demanded to, to have utmost integrity in this because you guys wouldn't trust me if I ever did anything less. So this was done. We paid a company to do this for us. They did it. It was selected by computer. And uh, Brian, if you're out there. Uh, <laughs> Let us know how we get this to you, my friend. Maybe, yeah, we'll make sure we'll get it to you, and, and maybe we'll, what we can do at some point in time is maybe Skype Brian into the future thing. And, and, He's not even and, in here. And uh, we'll, right. we'll tell him, thank you, he can tell us, thank you. Thank you to BAE, we've yeah. got more stuff coming. I'll tell you what, Mark is, uh, uh, Mark is, is making the best. Great uh, stuff. Great stuff. I mean, this, 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 is, this, this isn't used, this thing's just incredible. So congratulations again to Brian Boyhan. Um, thanks, guys, for tuning in. Um, make sure, again, you reach out to us. Those comments back and forth really help. Will will throw up that page of information that we have to make sure that you reach us. Make sure you write it down. Our Twitter handle, which is up right now, our YouTube page, our Facebook page. Um, of thing? course, I'm coming back to you. Okay. So let's make sure we do the homework again. Congratulations to Brian. Uh, Michael Brower and what he's going to do with the, the stuff in France is great. We've got some great guests coming up for you. Stay tuned. Tell your friends. Thank you for your support. And back to you, my Okay, man. guys, I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Like I wasn't philosophical enough. Uh, uh, but, you know, we've got all this bandwidth out there. Some of us have been eaten up on things that, that we've covered in the past. Let's use a little bit of bandwidth to try and help each other out. Let's, let's use a little bit of that bandwidth to, to share with each other things that we've heard that really um, that, that really got us excited, songs that we like. I'm not talking about the crap you just did last night in your basement. I'm talking about some new stuff that you heard that you're not involved with. You know, share some of that stuff with us. Let us know what you're listening to. And, and the things that Herb has, has said, think about some of that stuff. I mean, I, I got a feeling the guy that's going to change our music industry is listening to the show now, and I want you to be that guy. So think about this stuff. Get those questions and cards and letters in for Herb. I talk to him every day about this stuff and and and, and whatever little success I've had as a function of a lot of those conversations. Uh, uh, and both ways, it, it works both ways. So you can hit the Pensado Place Facebook page. You can hit me. You can hit whatever the case may be. But again, we want to be a community that's helpful. And uh, and yeah. again, they're they're all opinions. Research it. There may be some countervailing opinions. But you guys make the show. And just yeah, I'll tell you what, that. guys. Going over this list of, of the guests, I, I, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for giving me the opportunity to hang out with my friends, the 18 or 19 people on this list. Uh, More the, to come. Yeah. Um, the show, uh, hopefully, your, 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 your comments keep saying we get better and better and better all the time. We're, we're, we're trying to, 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 to get better all the time, but we really enjoy hanging out with you. We really enjoy you allowing us to hang out with our friends and make flatulence jokes. Um, and uh, shout out to the staff out there. They've been doing a great job. Am I leaving anything out, Herbert? No, just uh, weird that you would tie our staff out there into flatulence, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of here. It's been a good hour. Thanks, good. Thanks guys. Adios, amigos. See you.